Racism in the recruitment process is, is, is endemic really. A more sort of collective example is I dealt with a, a, a reorganisation once in a local authority housing department where they'd gone from specialist workers to generic workers. What they did is reduce the number of jobs as well. So everybody had to apply for their jobs. The only people that didn't get the jobs uh, exclusively were the black women that worked in that, that housing department. About f five or six years ago, um, the government done a CV testing exercise, uh, which where they put out uh, the same CVs but with different names to uh, to employers, and the, the, those with the BME names uh, didn't get get didn't get interviews. People talk about disparities. Actually, what we're, we're really talking about, and people don't want to talk about it. It, it is, is, is institutional um, racism. Often what you'll hear in terms of recruitment is people talking about, well, you know, uh, yes, we, we, we've got equal opportunities policies, we, we, we don't think we're racist. And then they'll go on to say, but you know, in terms of what we do, we, of course we have to appoint the best person for the job. What they never challenge is their image of who's the best person for the job. Uh, and the best person for the job often is somebody that looks uh, and like them and is often from the same class as them as well. Everyday racism is the normalised experiences that we encounter daily based on our difference from the white norm. For example, being sarcastically asked by a tutor when I attended the Royal Institution Mathematics Masterclasses how many of the tribe I was bringing to the family celebration day. I could go on, I've left out the hard stuff. I've visited countless schools and again and again and again seen children of African origin get embarrassed when saying their own foreign sounding names, even at schools with predominantly black and Asian pupils. I'm yet to see a child called Tim or Paul laugh in shame as they introduce themselves. We cannot let ourselves be bullied into being silenced for fear of playing the race card. And whilst we must not conflate every act of prejudice with structural white supremacy, we must recognise the relationship between top-down propaganda and the bias that we carry. Fighting prejudice, both in society and within ourselves, is a key part of the search for justice. Are you a Diane Abbott fan, or like many people at the Labour Party, do you feel that her performance in the last seven days has wrought unbelievable damage to the credibility of your party to be in government and to run any kind of competent administration. Well, when I was growing up, Piers, there were very few people at all who looked like me in the House of Commons. <coughs> and so, as a teenager, I certainly didn't think I'd ever have the privilege of doing the job that I've done since I was elected to represent my constituency since 2010. And the bottom line is that people of my background, we stand on Diane's shoulders. She was one of those people who showed me that I can represent 100,000 people with the in respect, Parliament. Jogger, so you're, you're asking with me... Respect, I mean, with you respect, with respect, this has got nothing to do with the colour of <coughs> Diane Abbott's skin. I'm not saying... ...about mindless abuse. And in my case, the mindless abuse has been characteristically racist and sexist. And just to outline, I've had death threats, I've had people tweeting that I should be hung if, quote, they could find a tree big enough to take the fat bitch's weight. There was an EDL affiliated Twitter account, hashtag burn Diane Abbott. I've had rape threats described as a pathetic, useless, fat, black piece of shit, ugly, fat, black bitch, and nigger. Nigger over and over again. And one of my members of staff said that when people ask her what is the most surprising thing about coming to work for me, the most surprising thing for her is how often she has to read the word nigger. And this comes in through emails, through Twitter, through Facebook. For me, first of all, it kind of does get in your head. It kind of does demoralise you and it does, even though you know it shouldn't do, it does make you doubt yourself. I mean, in 30 years, I have been able to see change. I mean, I was the first Member of Parliament made a speech about Stephen Lawrence and I, with Bernie Grant, who was an MP at the time, and Paul Button, we took Doreen Lawrence to meet Jack Straw when Labour was still in opposition and he completely, she completely swept him away. And as a consequence, we had the McPherson inquiry. So you can make change, you can make a difference. 
One of the questions that I'm often is asked is whether or not I have faced racism during my career because of the industry which I have entered in and the makeup of that industry. And advertising, you would think, creative industry, quite accepting, quite left field, quite liberal. But I have experienced racism, not directly to my face, but I have experienced it. And I remember when I um, was doing a pitch trying to win a new client, and we weren't successful. And at that time in my career, I was the account director. So I'm the person that would have led the business as if it came into the agency. And we didn't win this piece of business, but it's a small industry, and I knew the people at the other agency that were successful, and I knew the person that was going to be the account director. And they took the new client out for drinks, and as you would do, try to find out about the competition. Well, what did X agency do? What did X agency do? So they asked, what did Mediacom did? And the two clients, two male clients, said, oh, actually... Mediacom, they, they were really good, actually. They were pretty good. But there is no way we would have a female account director, let alone a black one. And that is personal, because that's about me. That's not about the work. That's not about the agency. That is about me. And I would be lying if I said that that didn't hurt me, because of course it did. Now, Mayor Angelou had a brilliant, brilliant quote that she said, which was, you can't always affect the events which will happen in your life, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. And that is so true. So there are some things that I can't control. I couldn't control what those people thought of me. I couldn't control their feelings and their perceptions, but I wouldn't let it reduce me. And if I'd won that client, it would have meant trying to fit in with that client, and I would have been miserable and I would have been unhappy, and it is not worth it. We waste too much time and energy trying to fit in and trying to please other people in order to progress.